Hi everybody, um, my name is Martin Day and I'm a, a senior sales engineer at Beyond Identity. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes here talking to you about how Beyond Identity can help you uh, secure your environments and prevent security breaches at source, rather than simply detecting and responding to intrusions after the fact. Now, a key part of this relates to the realization that typical current MFA deployments simply don't keep the bad guys out. So I don't know anyone who likes passwords, they're not secure, and they're an absolute pain to use. Attempts over the years to make passwords more secure by increasing the length, by complexity, by adding expiry to passwords, so people have to reset the passwords at regular intervals. Well, they've all simply just made them more painful to use without significantly enhancing security. Just look at the billions of compromised credentials that are available out on the dark web at the moment. Now, MFA was developed as a band-aid, but hasn't actually stopped major attacks like the Coinbase attacks or SolarWinds attacks. One-time codes, SMS, push notifications, and tokens, they are all fishable. So they're hackable and don't actually eliminate passwords. MFA was actually, um, or what MFA has done is ultimately add a ton of friction for your users. So most companies avoid, avoid rolling it out for all of their apps and users, perhaps just for a subset of applications is all that they can uh, actually manage to do without upsetting their users too much. It may well have been the best option at the time, but simply it's no longer good enough. So if we look at the US government, even they acknowledge that MFA as it's currently used is not acceptable. Only just this last January, the government issued a memo that describes their plan to move towards a zero trust architecture by 2024. It requires the use of phishing resistance MFA. So there's no more phone numbers for SMS, no more one-time codes, no push notifications. It also requires the tracking of security posture of all devices that log in. If you take a moment just to think at the moment of all the MFA mechanisms you're used to using, probably the vast majority of those are explicitly ones and that the US government is saying you should no longer be using. And in fact, as far as government agents are con uh, agencies are concerned, they're being told simply you must not use them in future. But that's not the only indication that MFA isn't working. Take Microsoft, for example. They are very concerned over the slow MFA adoption. Just recently, they announced that last year, only 22% of their enterprise organizations actually use MFA. We know cyber insurance premiums are on the rise and account takeover fraud has increased by almost 30% just in the last year. And it's difficult to meet the requirements of PSD2 with MFAs in the market today. But there's another problem beyond establishing user identity. What about all the devices that are being used to log in? How secure are they? So let's assume you securely authenticated the user and so you're pretty sure that it really is your CRO accessing your financial data. But what if the device he is using is compromised such that an intruder can see and access all that your CRO has access to? Obviously, that's not a good position to be in. Now, only the devices that you trust and that meet your requirements should be able to gain access. But that's really a complex problem. How do you know if you can trust them? One approach is you can require your workforce to only use company issued devices. And that may well have worked well for businesses in the past. But the reality is, especially with the move to home working, uh, accelerated obviously by the COVID crisis, is that most companies don't want to do that today. They want to enable a workforce to be productive and actually use personal devices as well. But they have no way to do that securely without adding a lot of friction or infringing on a user's personal privacy with heavy duty technology like MDMs or EDRs. Now consumers are also using more devices and businesses want to provide a frictionless and secure login experience, no, ma no matter what those devices are that the consumers are using. So we think that in order to have strong authentication, you have to be able to answer three questions. First of all, can we verify the person? And obviously MFA will play a big part in that. But additionally, are they using a device that they've been authorized to use? And can that device be trusted? 
And that's precisely what Beyond Identity does. So with Beyond Identity, you can verify the identity of every user and device that's logging in using proven public key cryptography. And now we've made it scalable for users across all of the different devices they're using, whether it's desktop, laptop, tablets, or mobile devices. You can also eliminate passwords and insecure authentication methods like those fishable MFA approaches we've talked about. There are no passwords at login or in a directory, so there are no more password policies and support costs. And of course, a password can't be stolen if there is no password in the first place. Good news is that it's really easy for users to use. They simply enroll their devices one time then simply log in with a biometric or pin if you want that additional locally um, authorized step up authentication, just using local credentials rather than shared credentials, which is the key architectural issue with passwords when you're using shared credentials. <clears throat> Additionally, you can check every user and device for risk to ensure that they can be trusted at login. And we automatically check in real time the applications, files, security programs, and security settings of all the authenticating devices to stop risky access. And the really good news here is that you do not need a second device to do this. So no more scrabbling around for your phone to look up a code in order to be able to log into your corporate services. So then, these three authentication, uh, <clears throat> sorry, these strong authentication uh, methods that we're talking about can be used to secure three different parts of your business, your workforce, your customers, and your development operations. So first of all, in our product range, we talk about secure work for the workforce. Here you get strong, unfishable MFA and device-based access controls to all your resources in your single sign-on environment. This eliminates password-based attacks, prevents lateral movements, and reduces help, dos, help desk costs. With secure customers for the Siam space, you get frictionless passwordless authentication to secure your customer applications, either through a set of SDKs, APIs, or integrations with an existing identity provider. This solution helps to improve revenue by reducing drop-offs from login frustration and reduces, of course, account takeover fraud. Finally, with secure DevOps, you can verify the identity of users checking code into your repo. This way, you know that what your developers built is what you shipped. It prevents your software components from being contaminated with malware and unwanted code, and then infecting, inflecting all of your customers. So let's have a look at those three elements in a little more detail to understand how the solution um, works. So simple architecture diagram of um, a secure work setup. So over here on, on the left, we see we have um, the user's device, could be a desktop, laptop, uh, mobile device, tablet, whatever, running all the common uh, operating systems out there. So your, your Mac, your, um, uh, your Windows, iOS, Android, Linux. This user ultimately wants to gain access to their applications. Now, these applications could be integrated directly with Beyond Identity, but typically in the secure workforce scenario, there is a single sign-on provider in place. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with solutions such as Okta, Microsoft, Ping, uh, OneLogon, uh, et cetera. So the idea is that the target applications delegate the actual authentication responsibilities to the single sign-on provider and so get gain a better single sign-on experience for their users. <clears throat> In this case, the single sign-on authentication methods are largely based upon fishable mechanisms. And so the single sign-on provider actually delegates the authentication to the beyond identity solution, where we can be sure of the identity and the device that is trying to gain access. To that end then, the beyond identity uh, cloud element is where we store public keys, where the policy engine exists, and also where we offer a web application known as the user console, which is a self-service interface to allow users to manage their own device registrations. So then, how does this actually work? So the first thing is we need to provision an account into the Beyond Identity Cloud tenant. This can be done in a variety of ways, but the most common way is to use the system for cross-domain identity management, which is the de facto standard uh, for automated provisioning on the web today. 
This uses the single sign-on provider as the source of truth for identities to create the account. Now, once the account is created in um, Beyond Identity, we can then invite the user either via an email link or by directing them to this user console component in order to register de devices. So typical registration becomes a two-step process. The first step is the user will be prompted to download what we call our platform agent, or our platform authenticator, I should say. Um, you can think of this as a personal certificate authority. So our approach is based upon cryptographic mechanisms, okay? But there is no central CA for you to manage. This is all handled by the Beyond Identity Platform Authenticator itself. Now, of course, this can be pre-installed so that the user doesn't need to do this, whether it's via an MDM or so that some other automated mechanism. <clears throat> the second step um, uh, for the user to register their device is to actually follow a registration link. Fundamentally, what that does, it invokes the platform authenticator to generate the key pair and crucially store the private key in a secure enclave, also known as a trusted platform module or a trusted execution environment. This is typically a separate chip on the motherboard of the all modern devices where materials such as private keys can be securely held. Those private keys once there cannot be extracted, they cannot be cloned or copied, they cannot be accessed over the network. So it's a very secure place to store the user's private keys. What this then means, having done this registration step, is that the user's identity has now been cryptographically bound to this device. And at this point in time, if nothing else happens, this is the only device that can access the services as this user. Now, we'll see later on, you can extend those credentials, so you can allow the user to have multiple devices um, registered. But that's a very strong posture to begin with. It's an incredibly strong factor. The user's device becomes the something I have. Now, you may have sort of been indoctrinated over the last 10 years to sort of think that in MFA terminology, for you to have something you have, that means you need a separate device. But actually that's weakening your security because the device we are interested in, the device we want to get security signals from is the device that's actually being used to access the corporate data. And that is the device that is um, cryptographically bound to that user's identity. So now that we're in that position, the user can go ahead and try and attempt to access the target applications, which defer to the single sign-on solution. Of course, the single sign-on solution will defer the user to, or sometimes that's called a, uh, using us as a delegated IDP, okay? We use standards-based integrations for that integration, so OpenID Connect, SAML, or WS Federation. And it's at this point that the authentication actually happens. And this is the very strong first factor authentication based upon that crypto cryptographically bound identity to that device. Now, if you want to um, invoke an additional step of authentication at this point, then absolutely you can define policy to say from this device under these conditions, then I wish you to um, do a step up authentication using this locally held biometric or validation of the device. So whether that's a face ID or a touch ID, or, or possibly you may even allow a pin backup. Um, now, on a subject of, of PIN being used as a factor, obviously that's the something you know factor, whereas biometrics is something you have. But it's worth bearing in mind that the PIN we're talking about is a not a centrally shared secret. It's only known on that device. So if an intruder was to guess your password, uh, your PIN rather, it does them absolutely no good unless they're actually in physical possession of um, the device to which the PIN has been set. So whether you use single factor, whether you use multi-factor, the, the user is um, then identified at this point. But of course, that's only part of the story. What we then want to do is to check the device posture that the user is connecting from, so not of any second device. So is the firewall enabled? Is antivirus um, enabled? Or uh, is there an EDR integration? Is the um, device managed by an MDM maybe? If it's a mobile device, have you checked if it's um, routed? Have you checked if biometrics are enabled so <clears throat> somebody who steals the phone can't simply get in because it's biometric um, protected? 
So only by evaluating um, that security at this point in time, can you make a decision as to whether the user should be trusted on that device and if they should be considered authentication, authenticated. Assuming it is, then of course the response occurs and the user is directed back via the single sign-on provider uh, onto the target applications. So from the user's perspective, they may have been a completely seamless journey for them, or they may have been asked for a biometric pop-up, but everything else is seamless, happens in the background. And because that's an MFA mechanism, but it's completely invisible to the user, you will often hear us talk about our invisible MFA, or even more appropriately, invisible, unfishable MFA. So the current attacks out there using sort of well-known utilities like Evil Gen X2, which sets up fishable reverse proxies in front of websites to trick users, what actually happens there <clears throat> is that the intruder doesn't have to hack your MFA because the MFA is simply fishable. They allow that to um, happen via these sort of reverse proxies that are set up in front of the target services. And once the MFA has happened, the users accept the push notification, they simply steal the session cookies and assume that session from that user. And it's downloaded from GitHub, go play with it even. And um, you'll see how dangerous a tool um, that can be used in, in the wrong hands. It's also worth bearing in mind is what we're moving towards is that this whole cast of principle, this continuous authentication, um, so in this case, every time the user comes to us, we authenticate them. So it's no concept of having a session and then reusing that session again and again to access more applications. To us, every request is a fresh authentication, fresh device posture checking. But we're actually going beyond that to extend the capability to do it continuously. So at regular intervals, we will be able to reassess the security of the device currently being used to access services. And so maybe if, we, if it moves into a non-compliant state, for example, maybe the firewall is dropped, then what we'll soon be able to do is to invoke a kill switch to actually go and contact maybe Opta or OneLogin or whoever and actually terminate that connection to make sure that you are no longer vulnerable as a result of the security moving in, of the device moving into a uh, non-compliant state. It's also worth bearing in mind that we integrate with third parties. Um, so beyond our own uh, native policy checking, we can call out to uh, MDMs and EDRs. Maybe you can get a risk score from CrowdStrike. Maybe you can check with Intune that the device is registered if it is a corporate managed um, device. And additionally, all the authentication mechanisms that we have um, uh, or the authentication attempts and device enrollments, those events can be, uh, can be sent over to Symbia uh, and API integration. <clears throat> Moving on from secure work into the SIAM space for secure customers. Now, you can take the exact same approach for customers as I've just outlined um, for secure work. However, with the SIAM use case, there is very much a far greater emphasis on a frictionless user experience. So it may not be appropriate to expect the users to download our platform authenticator. And to support this, we have various SDKs. In this case, our web SDKs. <clears throat> First of all, you can embed the credentials directly into your own web application. So there's no need to call out to any other service to authenticate. One way of doing this is via the WebAuthn specification, where we use the WebAuthn APIs to manage the asymmetric cryptography. Fundamentally, what we're doing here is storing the private key in the TPM. So it's a similar model to the platform authentication, but it's just in the context of a browser rather than being platform wide. But you may well be that you're on a device or um, an, an operating system and, and browser combination that doesn't yet support web author, or maybe the user's using an old browser, for example, in which case we can stream, uh, we can seamlessly fall back to a software based mechanism, meaning that the private keys do not actually end up in a trusted platform module. Um, <clears throat> and that's using a web crypto uh, uh, mechanism. Alternatively, if you don't want to embed the credentials directly into your web application, you can actually have a simpler integration where you simply call out to our hosted uh, standalone authenticator uh, where the authentication happens. So when the user chooses to log in, they're redirected to this uh, URL at authenticator.binded.com where the authentication happens and we redirect the user back to the web application 
That interface also has some simple device management so the user can go in and manage their own credentials that they uh, um, have registered. In either case, the key point here is that the user need only have access to a browser. They can benefit from this secure passwordless experience without anything else um, to, do, to, to download. But also in the secure customer space, you may well find that you have customers that want to offer more than just a, a web experience. They also want to offer a native mobile application uh, experience. In other words, they want to offer an omnichannel experience. And for this, we also have a series of SDKs. With this, it's very easy for the developer to call out using our SDKs, um, using our own UI that we provide with the SDKs, or alternatively, completely build our own UI for the look and feel that the organization requires. They use the SDK for all the cryptographic binding functions and all the interactions with the Beyond Identity Cloud. The end result is that you can create strong credentials on every platform and retain control of that experience such that users can enroll devices, they can log in, they can migrate the credentials from one browser to maybe another browser or a desktop or, or, or whatever it may be. Um, <clears throat> And of course, when using our mobile SDKs, again, we have access to the un underlying device security posture so that we can maybe enforce a step up to do a biometric authentication or whatever is appropriate for the given environment. Um, <clears throat> additionally, um, I've already mentioned actually the ability to brand the authentication experience uh, or use our own out of the box approach. And we support this on uh, obviously the iOS and Android platforms using Swift, Kotlin, uh, Flutter and also React Native. So the final stream from our core platform or, or the final use case we address from the single platform is to do with secure DevOps. Now the fundamental issue we're addressing here is to prevent supply chain compromise. So think SolarWinds for example. It is often virtually impossible to track source code provenance. Developers often don't sign source code committed to corporate repositories. And those that do often use keys that are tied to a personal identity rather than a validated corporate identity. And the Beyond Identity solution consists of two main elements, one client side, one server side. So let's look at how this works. So here we have a dev workstation as running a Git client of one source or another. And they're now wanting to commit some code changes up to their local repo. And it's at this point that the Beyond Identity platform authenticator kicks in and uses a registered private GPG key to digitally sign the commit to the local repo. The developer then pushes the signed code to the central repo, whether it's GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, Azure DevOps. Uh, and this is where the second Beyond Identity component comes into play. We provide a Git action that is used to verify the signature of the commit and user identity is also validated at that stage. And that's done by, by um, the Git provider calling out to the Beyond Identity Authorization API to verify that the commit is signed by a corporate identity. Any unsigned, un, un, any unsigned or unverified commits will cause the pipeline to reject the commit. And assuming the validation succeeds, the pipeline can continue uh, as desired. And in this way, we ensure source code provenance and prevents supply chain attacks. So who uses identity, uh, Beyond Identity then? Uh, well, lots of organizations, whether it's one element of, of the product line or whether it's multiple elements, uh, including high tech, biotech and financial services. Now they chose Beyond Identity for a variety of users. Maybe they wish to remove password from user experience and so get rid of that um, uh, element of friction. Maybe they've seen the light and have realized that their MFA they've been using for a while, if at all, is a fishable MFA and actually isn't adding much security at all uh, to, to the system. And so they may want to re uh, replace the current MFA with Beyond Identity's unfishable MFA. They want to support bring your own device, absolutely critical um, these days, say, with the, with the greater move to home working, the ability to have secure endpoint security strategy using traditional MDMs and EDRs, that isn't always appropriate in the modern world we live in today. So we need to enhance and supplement the capability um, uh, that customers are used to. And additionally, we can uh, enhance or potentially even replace 
VPN remote work strategies. If you think what you're using the VPN for, traditionally it was used for two things, as a control access point and to protect access to on-premise resources. These days, those on-premise resources largely exist in the cloud, but customers still retain VPNs to act as a control point where they can apply policy. But what we do, of course, is move the uh, the security and that control point to the left. So when the user first tries to interact with your services, whether it's to the VPN or the target services directly, it's at that point that our security um, kicks in and gives you that control point. So finally then, why would you want to work with um, Beyond Identity? So a little bit about Beyond Identity and why you can uh, trust us. So first of all, we have an experienced um, team and a very experienced team of founders. We only announced ourselves to the market in April um, 2020, and so far have raised a total of $205 million in funding. Most recently, just last month, a further $100 million uh, in Series C was raised. Currently, we have a team of over 175 employees, and the two gentlemen you can see there, Jim Clark and TJ, or Tom Jemmel, um, they have over 30 years plus of working together at Netscape, Silicon Graphics, and more. And they were largely responsible for bringing us the Netscape browser and SSL um, to the marketplace all these years ago. And they want to extend that, the concept of a, a, a cryptographic PKI-based mechanism to individual users as well. We're a highly scalable and reliable platform of two data centers in Frankfurt and Ohio, with backups in Dublin and Oregon. And we have a 99.95% uptime. For compliance and security, we've achieved SOC 2 type, certificate, uh, type 2 certification, and we can help our customers to meet their own GDPR, CCPA, PSD2, SCA uh, for secure customers, uh, the, all their compliance requirements as well. So, Hopefully we've piqued your interest and you'd like to join our revolution. Choose the strongest, most secure authentication and finally eliminate those pesky passwords and stop credential based attacks in your organization today. So with that, I'll thank you very much. Uh, I don't think we've probably got any time at the moment, but please uh, call out to our booth and you can have a, a chat with several representatives we have uh, uh, available um, today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. If you could quickly address one question that you've got from uh, Ramesh uh, Murugesan, he's asking, how does it work to identify the vulnerabilities at code level as part of secure DevOps? Okay, so what we're actually doing at the code level, we're, we're not any performing any analysis of the code itself. So that's um, um, you know a, a different set of, of services. What we're actually doing is actually guaranteeing the provenance of that code. So if you think of your developer community, they may exist all around the world using all sorts of machines. And so how can you, and, and if they are signing code, they're likely sharing the, the key across multiple devices. So how much trust is in there? So what our solution is about is making sure that it really is one of your employees that is committing that code into your pipeline. OK, so that there's no malicious user that can easily go in and say, yes, I'm Joe Bloggs from Acme Incorporated, and here's the latest update, which has been a route of compromise and supply chain uh, compromises really, uh, lately. Th does that make sense? That uh, I guess uh, Ms. Murugesh will, be, Murugesh will be able to decide that. And in case there are any follow-up questions, uh, like Martin said, you can reach out to the representatives at the booth, and uh, you can take up all these uh, questions that you have in uh, detail with the representatives there. Thank you so much, Martin, for joining us uh, with that presentation. And thank you so much for answering the question uh, that you have tried to address. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Enjoy the day.